actually mm. before I met her because I was looking for her. I, um, I had left Catholicism behind me, but I discovered that I needed something to replace it. After a few years, I was like, what do I do when somebody is sick? You know, who do I pray to? That sort of thing. So um, I started looking for a female deity that I would have something in common with. Like I was interested in Sumerian and Egyptian, but culturally, I don't have anything in common with them. So I was looking for someone I did. And then I found her, a paragraph about her in, a, in the pages of a book. And I just kept looking and finding more from there. So that was in the early 80s. I started writing poetry, more like chants or hymns, to her pretty much as soon as we hooked up in the 80s. But I didn't write many. <clears throat> and, um, and then... In 2011 or 2010, I found out that I had cancer and it was like, it was caught in the early stages, but it was a very aggressive cancer. So I was very afraid for my life. And suddenly I just started writing from the depths of my bowels. I was writing to her. Um, and, and then as I recovered, um, I remained kind of opened up and I started just writing more and more. I think within the first six months, I probably wrote 200 poems to her. Just everything I learned about her inspired at least one more poem. It was exciting. <laughs> It's possible. I have been sort of feeling out the vague outlines of, of a smaller book, but I haven't settled on anything yet. I also sometimes think about doing a children's book because there are lots of children's books about St. Bridget, um, but there aren't a lot about the goddess, none that I've found so far. So we could use a few of them. All speculation here. I mean, everyone is speculating about this. Some people feel certain, <laughs> but really there's no proof one way or the other. Um, so my strong uh, inclination is that there were both. Um, that there was a pre-Christian goddess named Bridget um, who had this this the two sisters or the rather the three sisters were the form that she took in the most well-known myth about her um and that she had her areas of interest and oversight not over all of ireland but probably in leinster or something um and that there was also a woman named bridget the name is not uncommon in Ireland, and uh, that she was an early Christian. In the 5th century when she was born, there were Christians around, but they weren't localized. And St. Bridget had a lot to do with uh, forming communities. Um, so she was sort of one of the pioneering saints of Ireland. And I don't see a lot of the goddess in her except in the ways that people from a similar culture and similar time might have anyway. Um, so it's possible that they were connected in the past. I don't think they necessarily were. And so I try to, you know, give to the goddess what is the goddesses and give to the saint what is the saints. I like to acknowledge um, that. But now in both Christian and pagan worlds, they're, very combined and so if they weren't um, affiliated <laughs> in the iron age they certainly are now so
well, there are a couple of different things. One is I'm just reading something or I'm out on a walk somewhere and something really catches me, uh, so, uh, an idea about her or a way that I see her in the environment or something. And, and so then I just sit down and start composing. <laughs> so it's just completely spontaneous. And um, that's really nice. Um, <clears throat> but when I know I'm going to sit down and write, <laughs> I usually come to it with a little bit of uh, nervousness ahead of time. I guess I don't have an enormous amount of confidence that when I sit down, I'm going to be able to do what I want to do. I mean, I do. <laughs> so I should know that by now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I come to it with a little nervousness. So I do things like I, I have, you can't see her, but I have a lovely image of St. Bridget actually over my, I almost called this my altar, <laughs> the altar of the laptop. <laughs> so she's up on the wall and it's a very inspiring image. It's by Sue Ellen Parkinson. Um, and when I look up at that, that really helps me to just go, oh, yes, that's why I'm here. Um, so that's that's one thing. I often will light a candle and just have it out out of range. So I, I don't have a very big desk, but I can see the life, that living, moving flame. That's very calming. And I also allow myself to to put it off for half the or three quarters of the day and do, you know, the dishes and get the place immaculate, <laughs> unlike it ever is normally because I'm nervous to sit down. And that just helps me get it out of my system a bit. And then when I sit down, I just go for it. And once I'm sinking into um when when I write, I am really imagining it. I'm so I am there. And I am just trying to pick up what I can see about what's happening there and how it looks, how it feels, what's that around the corner. So I'm I'm more like an observer in a way. And um and so I'm just there trying to see what I can see and put it down. Um and later I I go over the poems and over them and over them and over them um to get them cleaner and neater and make sure that they make what I, uh, they say what I, what that original vision is and that they're, yeah, that they, there's something that makes sense. There's some integrity to them. I believe in them <laughs> and, and then I can let them go. I chose a woman that I know. Her name's Eileen Kernahan, and she has uh, just one book of poetry, lots of novels, and a couple of nonfiction, but just one book of poetry. Um, and it's all just so magical. She wrote speculative fiction, fantasy, and some science fiction. Um, and in each one of her poems, there's something about how she dwells in that poem that I'm just immediately sucked right in there. I'm in this magical forest. I'm in this painting. I'm, you know, on the Mars dome. Or So it can be really microscopic or it could be hugely cosmic in scale. And I am completely there. And, and, so there's something about her perspective that's just very alive, but she also can be talking about some very nuanced, very subtle things. Um, and just with with her, again, I'll use the word magical, but her magical words, she just leads me into an eyes. And after each poem, I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> so um, there is one other. You said one, but I'm going to say two. The Mary Oliver, and I know everybody loves Mary Oliver, but Mary Oliver um, was so grounded with the land, with the the domestic, but also mostly the wild, the land, the creatures on it, and um, but also with with herself as a being. And so when I read her poems, 
it's like she's um, she's sewing me back together using the grass and the fur, and I just I feel healed by a lot of her poems. I look up in despair. No, not despair. Just I've got so many things going on right now. There's no big book project, but um, in 1993, um, I had just started a group called Daughters of the Flame in order to reignite Bridget's flame in the world. I I didn't know that on that very day in Ireland, the sisters of St. Bridget were doing the same thing. So they had a public lighting, relighting of Bridget's flame. And I had a private with just a few people connected to it, relighting. And we've been tending her flame for 30 years in, you know, this coming in bulk. It'll be 30 years. And so um, I have been working on our our big <laughs> newsletter, trying to get lots of contributions and, and um, uh, yeah, bring in things from older older newsletters so people will have an idea of where we've been all these years. So that's one thing. But I'm also doing a couple of giveaways. I right now I've got a giveaway going for for this book. Ding. Um and then when that's over I'll have another giveaway for one of my Bridget classes. I know there's about a million other things going on but just going blank. <laughs> oh, yeah. Alicia Starza is um, interviewing me, so I'm working on that too. And yeah, just a few different things. I've thought long and hard about this, and I was going into times in, you know, the early days in Ireland to see what was happening with Bridget and, and Irish culture and history altogether. And, but you know what I actually finally um, landed on was I would have liked to be in the room, probably in Saskatchewan, which is one of the Canadian provinces. There was a group um, called the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation that eventually morphed into the new democratic party that we have in Canada here. And that's the more left leaning of the party. It's the one that um, doesn't tend to be in power. Well, I don't think it's ever been in power federally, but it, it goes back and forth in the provinces, <clears throat> but they are always a vocal opposition to brain schemes of, <laughs> of the liberals and the conservatives. Um, so this, a lot of the, the work of forming that, that group was done in the prairies with the farmers who um, formed co-ops so that they could get their grain to the side of the, yeah, the elevators and whatnot and, and defend their own rights. Um, and when Tommy Douglas was in, in, power in Saskatchewan. It was the first socialist government ever in Canada. And one of the things that he, not just he, but his party, one of the things that they did was they initiated for Saskatchewan uh, publicly funded health care. And a number of years later, the federal government here finally bowed down <laughs> to the pressure and and made a, a national scheme and so it's it's a very it's a very complicated scheme it doesn't matter there's province have control of this feds have control of that but the the long and the short of it is that to a large degree everyone in canada has the right to medical care whether you can get it or not is sometimes <laughs> a different question but but we have the right and it's it's covered by our um actually pretty inexpensive uh, insurance schemes. So I would have liked to be in the room with Tommy Douglas and the rest of the CCF when that national program was finally announced. 
I just, I just can imagine the joy. I mean, when, when my mother was a child, she would go with her mother to the pharmacist down the street if, if she was sick. And, and her mom would trade things for some ointment that the pharmacist had made. They had no money. And so they had no right to health care. I was alive when the public or when the national scheme came into being. So it really isn't that long ago. And uh, yeah, I would have loved to be there. <laughs> My socialist roots are showing. <laughs> The only answer that is truly honest is I would invite all three Bridgets, <laughs> the three sisters, and we would sit down and break it down for me because there's so much I don't know and that I would really love to know. Like what what was it like for them in, you know, before Christianity when uh, when people just knew of them? How did how did it all play out? And how is there any difference in age? Why do you all have the same name? Like, is it really your name or was it a title? I, there's so much I want to know. And um, I'd be willing to pay for dinner to find all that out. <laughs> as long as they didn't mind me recording it. Yeah, I'd love that. Don't believe that you're too good or too bad. Work really, really hard and clean up your writing as much as is humanly possible. Listen to other people, but don't necessarily believe them. But don't necessarily not believe them and never give up. Not on yourself as a writer. You might want to give up on that story because it really does stink. <laughs>